Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in. Um, just a reminder that we shall be recording today's program and any views expressed in this webinar are for general educational purposes only and do not represent any official views or positions of the sponsoring or presenters organizations. We look forward to your questions, so please keep them sending during the presentation in using the Q&A section. Greetings and welcome to today's educational program in the webinar series of Preparing for Process Analysis number nine, Listening to the Customer by Sandy Furter and Doug Wood. This is your moderator, Shobha Middle with ASQ Quality Management Division. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Sandy and Doug. Please join me in welcoming them. Dr. Sandy Furter is a professor of practice at the Ohio State University in the Department of Integrated Systems Engineering she has applied Lean Six Sigma systems engineering and engineering management tools in healthcare and other service industries. She previously managed the Enterprise Performance Excellence Center in a healthcare system. Dr. Furter received a PhD in industrial engineering with a specialization in quality engineering from the University of Central Florida in 2004. She received an MBA from Xavier University as a bachelor and master's of science in industrial and systems engineering from the Ohio State uh, University. Dr. Furcher has over 25 years of experience in business process and quality improvement. She has an ASQ certified Six Sigma Black Belt, certified manager of quality and organizational excellence, certified quality engineer, an ASQ fellow, and a certified Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Dr. Furcher is an author of and co-author of several academic journal and articles, conference proceedings, and nine reference textbooks. She co-edited the ASQ CQIA handbook and the ASQ CMQ OE handbook and is the editor of the ASQ CQPA handbook. She also published a textbook on systems engineering, holistic life cycle architecture, modeling and design with real world applications, CRC Press 2021. I will now introduce Doug Wood. Mr. Doug Wood has worked over 40 years in the areas of cost of quality, office waste, root cause analysis, performance measurement, etc. He has helped others with various ASQ certifications in quality auditing, management, and engineering. He has also taught audit, lean, Six Sigma, cost of quality, statistics, and failure modes and effects analysis. He has four ASQ certifications, CQE, CQA, SSBB, and CMQOE. Doug was the recipient of 2023 ASQ Quality Management Division Howard Jones Award given for outstanding long-term services as the Vice Chair of Education from 2015 to 2021. He has three publications from ASQ Quality Press, the Certified Manager of Quality and Organization Excellence Handbook, 5th edition. Uh, Sandy co-edited this with Doug. The Executive Guide to Understanding and Implementing Quality Cost Programs to Reduce Operating Expenses and Increase Revenue, Principles of Quality Cost Financial Measures for Strategic Implementation of Quality Management, 4th edition. His firm, DC Wood Consulting LLC, has worked with clients in manufacturing, healthcare, and transactional businesses. The company's website is www.dcwoodconsulting.com. And so, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Sandy Furter and Doug Wood. Sandy and Doug, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Shoba. Uh, so, tonight we're going to do number nine in our series on preparing for process analysis. Uh, this one is on listening to the customer. <clears throat> I, I think this is one of my one of my favorite topics that we're going to cover here. Um, yeah, the, the, we've done. Eight others of these, and so this this would be the final one. <clears throat> Let tonight we're going to talk about why listening to customers really matters. Okay, now, we've all heard, oh, you got to listen to your customers, but you know what? Why does it matter? Uh, we're going to talk about some tools and methods for gathering customer feedback. We're going to talk about how to handle negative feedback, and we're going to discuss some common mistakes when collecting the voice of the customer. So, first of all, why listen to customers? If you want a customer centric business, <clears throat> you want to know customers thoughts and feelings about your current products and services and how those thoughts and feelings pertain to customer retention. You want to know what they want, what they need. You think, you know, but you could be wrong. What if you're wrong? 
So <clears throat> meeting customer needs. The primary goal of your business is to provide products or services that satisfy customer needs and preferences. Forget about making money. Yeah, businesses have to make money. But you know what? You really need to serve your customer needs. That's why you're there. That's what you make. Retaining customers is important because <clears throat> retain, acquiring new customers is more costly and time consuming than retaining your existing ones. By understanding your customers, now you can identify and address issues promptly, increase their satisfaction and loyalty. Loyal customers are more likely to continue doing business over the long term. And when we say reducing churn, we mean by analyzing their feedback and behavior, you can identify what factors contribute to the loss of customers, and you can take proactive measures to stop it. Uh, addressing dissatisfaction, offering incentives, and improving your customer support are all ways you can do this. Now, it's a competitive advantage. <clears throat> In a competitive marketplace, understanding what sets your business apart from others is essential. Customer insights help you identify your unique selling points. Sometimes it's hard to tell what your selling points are until you talk to your customers. What is your value proposition? What do you deliver to them? And what strategies can you develop to outperform your competitors? Your reputation is crucial. If you listen and act on customer feedback, it will demonstrate a commitment to this and it builds a positive brand reputation, which can attract new customers and maintain existing ones. Remember, it only takes some few problems to destroy your reputation, and it's almost impossible to get it back these days. Service and product improvement. So feedback from customers tell you where you can go to improve your process. This is an iterative process. It makes sure that you stay relevant and meet all these evolving customer expectations. Innovation is driven because you hear what the customer's insights are. Customers often suggest novel ideas or maybe unmet needs, which can lead to the development of innovative products or services to capture new market segments. And of course, you can improve your efficiency. We've kind of talked a lot about that in our other talks. Um, reducing risk is something all managers try to do, and customer insights can alert you to potential issues early, to help you positive, you know, proactively address these things before they escalate. <clears throat> data-driven decisions. We all like to have data-driven decisions, but what's the data? If the data is coming from your internal people, maybe they don't know what your customers are saying. So these are all reasons why you would want to listen to your customers. <clears throat> uh, Sandy, it's your turn. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. All right, so I'm gonna cover just a few tools and methods for gathering customer feedback. And there's actually three specific ones, but I'll start first with just kind of generally identifying the types of tools and methods that we have to ask the customer what they want. So surveys and questionnaires are probably one of the most common ways because it helps us to uh, pretty quickly gather data from a large sample of our customers. Now, the only um, one of the difficulties with surveys and questionnaires, they're actually very difficult to create a very good and valid survey. So uh, sometimes you might say, leave that to the experts, but it's an excellent way. And when I teach Lean Six Sigma, my students always create some type of survey to create, to collect the voice of the customer. Social media monitoring, that is get becoming more and more popular. Uh, I worked for a bank, a very large bank, and they had a building and in the lobby of the building, they had a ticker of the social media comments. So if you kind of were um, looking for a little bit of a break and the Starbucks line, which was the busiest Starbucks in the US, was a little long, you could watch the voice of customer ticker go by and see all of the comments about the bank. Really fascinating. Customer interviews is another great way to collect voice of customer data. And the interviews are really helpful 
if you want to uh, really dig into the customer's comments. So the surveying questionnaires, you got one chance to ask the question really well, whereas customer interviews, you can, you can really get a lot of information. Um, and then feedback analytics and data collection tools. And there are a lot of those uh, becoming more and more common. Uh, I always thought it was interesting. I worked for a rather large retailer and they actually didn't own the point of sale data. They had to buy it back from the company that collected it, the cash registers. So that was uh, uh, one very kind of interesting, but very valuable analytics tool. Okay, Doug, you can forward. All right, so I'm going to cover three specific tools, uh, not in in uh, a lot of depth, but to just give you a, a kind of feel for the the vastness of the toolkit that you can use. I'm going to talk about quality function deployment in the house of quality, the CTQ critical to quality tree, and then Kano analysis. Okay. All right. So the quality function deployment and house of quality. The quality function deployment is actually a planning tool that really spans the requirements and even into the design phase. Now, typically how, how most people use it is with one, one house, uh, the beginning house where you're aligning customer requirements to technical requirements, but it's really designed to be a series of four different houses where you take the technical requirements and align them to the components, uh, the more detailed technical um, elements that you that would satisfy those technical requirements. You take those and align them to the uh, process requirements and those process requirements are then aligned to the quality requirements. So it's really effective if you use all of those those houses and relationships. But the first one that we're most most familiar with is after you've collected voice of customer data, that goes there on the left where we have needs. And we can prioritize those needs. And typically the people that are involved in that, in, in the uh, data collection, in a company can be marketing people, it can be business analyst type people, and so forth. And oh, Doug's got a little uh, laser pointer there. So there's the needs. Um, but the value of, of the house of quality and the quality function deployment planning tool is really to engage all of the people that have something to do with making uh, the customer needs into the reality of the product or the service. And so you may have engineers, you may have, you may have those business analysts, the marketing, um, and, and really uh, you may have, uh, if, if you manufacture a product, people from the shop floor, manufacturing engineers, process engineers, quality engineers, all of those people that can have input to this. So you align those needs with up there where you say performance, their technical requirements. So you convert those needs into how you're going to achieve those. And then you relate those where Doug's got the needs and features matrix to each other to ensure that you have covered all of the needs and that you can then prioritize the performance by multiplying the priority of the needs times the relationship strength. You can see the top house of, of the house of quality and that's the interaction so that some of these technical or performance requirements might interact with each other either in a positive way so that one as one increases the other increases or in a negative way whereas one increases the other decreases. So that's even more important to know. You can also assess your needs uh, against the competition. How are you helping to achieve the customer needs versus your competition? So this is a great tool uh, to be able to develop and, and prioritize and ensure alignment. Now, I when I teach Lean Six Sigma, I have my students relate the critical to quality characteristics that they identify early in the, in the project through define and measure. 
to the improvement ideas as the performance or technical requirements. How are they going to going to achieve those CTQs? Next slide. This is a great example uh, of a CTQ tree. Now, there's a lot of words there, but I'm just going to summarize here. So this is a way to to map out and and understand your customer verbatims. So if the customer says to me, if I make pizza and I want, and the customer says, I want pizza now. Well, I need to con convert that to something that is actionable for my pizza company, right? So what you do is you, you um, relate that um, in a second tier to something more specific such as when I want it, uh, I want it to be quick and easy to order, and I want as soon as possible delivery. So as you ask the customer in those interviews, you, you can understand the pizza now equates to those three requirements. So then you ask two questions and you say, is meeting each of these characteristics necessary for the customer to be satisfied? And would meeting all these characteristics be sufficient for satisfaction? So then we uh, repeat steps two and three for each answer in the second tier and create a third one. So when I want it, oh, they want it to the pizza parlor to be open from 11 a.m. to midnight. For quick and easy to order, they mean they want us to answer on the first ring when they call in their order, and they only want to take 45 seconds to, to uh, give the order. And then from the ASAP delivery, they want it at a minimum time. And then digging into that minimum time, I don't really have enough detail yet, they want it out the door in less than 20 minutes and a delivery in less than 15 minutes. And then what does out the door in less than 20 minutes mean to the process requirements in my organization? It means I have to have it in the queue less than eight minutes. I have to make it in less than two minutes. I have to bake it in nine. I have to pack it in less than 11 minutes. And then there can't be a wait. So it really helps you to define the requirements by, by digging into the, the verbatims and identifying the critical to quality. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Kano analysis. Now, Doug, you've got to hand over the um, pre presentation ability for me because I've got to show a picture because this is very exciting. So Dr. Kano created the Kano analysis, and Dr. Uh, Beth Cudney and I uh, were able to meet him at the, uh, the ASQ, the 2023 ASQ um, uh, World Conference on Quality and Improvement. And Doug actually got to meet him as well. So let me share this picture. All right, so can you see that picture? Yeah. So there's Doug. There's Peggy Mills, who is our for our past chair. There's me. And there's Dr. Pano. And he is just an absolutely delightful guy. Mm -hmm. And he sat in on the presentation that Beth and I delivered that was was an example of a Kano analysis in higher education. No pressure so there. No pressure there, right? No pressure there. <laughs> so that was great. <clears throat> All right. So you can go ahead, Doug, and present again. Okay. All right. So the Kano analysis is a really neat tool, and it's a tool that that most people kind of just uh, do a swag on and think, and I, I used to think this too until I learned more about it, um, that you can just kind of kind of spitball and say, 
I think these requirements are dissatisfiers or must be's or whatever, but there is a, a very strict methodology that he developed that goes along with these, these curves and graphs. So what, what Kano did is he, he identified different types of requirements. So the first type of requirement is the must be, the must be characteristics. And this is shown by this red curve in the lower right quadrant. And you can see this is mapping the requirements to the satisfaction. And the satisfaction goes from low to about the middle. Okay, so this characteristic, if it's not present, it causes dissatisfaction. But if it's present, it neither satisfies nor delights. But you have to have it or those customers are going to be dissatisfied. So I think of going back to the pizza example, if I order a cheese pizza and it has no cheese, <laughs> I'm going to be very dissatisfied. Yep. All right, next. A one dimensional characteristic. This is a characteristic that drives satisfaction and you can see the green line in direct correlation to its presence. So an example of that would be an interest rate on a savings account. As that rises, so does the satisfaction. And I found a really good one in an online bank, but anyway. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, another characteristic, we've probably all heard this term, is delighters. And it rep it is represented by that, I guess that's an orangish curve. And mm -hmm. it is, um, if absent, there's no effect on satisfaction. But when it's present, customers are delighted. So an example of this is cup holders. So back in the day when cars didn't have them, they started putting all sorts of things. I remember the the little little ones that kind of hung you you would try to attach, you know, to to maybe the heater uh and uh so you could have some kind of cup holder and then car companies got smart and they put in cup holders and it was like, "Oh, this is so cool. Now I can have my pop in the cup, the cup holder." Well, now who could get excited about a cup holder because eventually delighters evolve into uh, must must be. So that's one thing that it's important to always keep on top of this uh, from a from a analysis perspective and to continue to survey your customers because these these requirements change. Now, one thing I also want to say is the, the biggest mistake that people make is by not really analyzing or, or collecting data and analyzing it appropriately. Mm -hmm. Because the, the survey questions, the data that you get are, are from a survey question and from a survey and the questions are very specific. So give an example of, of what we had presented on at the WCQI was looking at identifying perceived teaching effectiveness attributes. So we came up with our best guess um, based on how we've been teaching over the years. And we identified 25 different attributes. And for each of these attributes, you have two questions. So if you have a lot of attributes like we do that we wanted to investigate, you can have a very long survey. So you just have to know that you might have a lot of people start the survey and then not finish it. And so that's, you're gonna have to consider sample size. However, it, it, you get a great analysis from it and you have two forms of questions. You have what's called a functional form. If the instructor, uh, so an example would be, if the instructor creates an inclusive learning environment, how do you feel? And then there are very five specific answers for every question, whether it's a functional or the dysfunctional form. I like it that way. It must be that way. I am neutral. I can live with it that way, or I dislike it that way. And those ratings correspond to the different characteristics that we just uh, talked about. And there were actually two more that we didn't, the, 
the reverse ones. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of the other one. The, oh, I don't have it up right now, but anyway, I always forget one. Um, but the dysfunctional form, that same question would look like if the instructor does not create an inclusive envir learning environment, how would you feel? And then the, the, the person answers the same questions. So then you can do a whole slew of calculations afterward, not anything terribly complex, but you can use your survey data to actually identify which ones of those attributes fall into which of those categories. So it's an absolutely wonderful tool. And I know there's some additional information on the analysis that you can do um, on uh, uh, my ASQ. So, all right, I think that was it, Doug. Mm -hmm. Now it's yours. Ah, so there are even more tools. Okay, <laughs> we're we're just giving you a laundry list here. We're we're not going to go into a lot of detail on these. Um, one of them is the uh, this is one of my favorites is the per importance performance analysis, and and this is one you'll find this one in Nancy Teague's Quality Toolbox Second Edition. Uh, and she goes into a fair amount of detail on how to do that. I have a handout, and if you want a copy explaining this one, send me an email, and I'll I'll, I'll forward it to you. Uh, I ba basically just took took out stuff out of the book and and created a handout of this one. The point of this one is trying to get your employees to understand how different your customers view your business. Okay, so you're asking employees to do they understand the customer? And you ask the customer, what do you think? And you compare those two. Uh, I, I've seen that that used very reliably to try to try to bring the voice of the customer into your organization. Customer complaints are a valuable thing, and and you need to, you need to collect and keep these things uh, and analyze them. Uh, satisfaction surveys again. List of questions. You you kind of figure out what what your satisfaction is. Um, you know, customer window is an exercise. Uh, lost customer research. Okay, when you lose a customer, why did they go? And and I know this can be hard because they left and they're mad, right? So it can be tough to figure out that information. But boy, it's powerful if you can get it. Uh, focus groups. There's advantages and disadvantages with focus groups. One of the advantages is you get in depth. You, you can go into depth. You can say, well, how do you feel about this? Right? You're not going to get that from a survey. But the disadvantage of a focus group is, well, as Sandy mentioned, sampling. You're going to have to take a sample of customers. Are they representative of the customers? And oftentimes good focus group work means you're going to focus on each different segment of customers and have a focus group on each of them to find out what they what they feel. Lifetime warranties can be extremely powerful. Okay. A lot of companies will give you a lifetime warranty. You buy this from us, and as long as you own it and it wears out, we'll replace it. Why would they do that? Well, because they usually ask for the, the worn out thing to come back again. And then they look at that worn out thing and they go, huh, this could be done better if we fix this. And so it's, it's a way to collect what, what are the customers. Say. Also, customers are going to be real loyal if there's a lifetime warranty. They, they, they really believe and they'll give you all kinds of information. Executive listening posts is kind of like the ticker tape that Sandy mentioned of the uh, customer responses in, in the lobby, except it's the executives who are listening listening in to what customers are actually saying. Uh, Net Promoter Score is, is another tool. Net Promoter Score is a way, when, when you ask people a question, and, and we ask a similar question at the end of these surveys, these, these talks. Uh, so on a scale of zero to 10, would you recommend this to your friends? And, and it's kind of an interesting question, because it's not asking what do you think, but would you recommend it? And, and in Net Promoter Score, I believe it's from a, you, you take the percentage that say zero to six and the percentage that say nine or 10, 
and you subtract the lower, you know, the people that don't like it from the people that do like it. And so you end up with a, a score, right? Uh, people who say seven and eight, they don't even matter. You see the zero to six, they're detractors. And the nine and 10, they are promoters. That's why it's called net promoter score. And, and you end up with a number that, that, that can work across almost any product, service, or business. Yeah. To what degree are you super satisfying people? That's what that one's all about. Now, analyzing and or, <laughs> organizing customer feedback, uh, we've already covered this, okay? Um, we, we have a QR code here to see number four in our current series, data collection and organization. And we have a QR code that you can go to for identifying trends and patterns, which was number five in our series, okay? So I'm just referring you to other, other talks in the series. Uh, but the important thing is you, you need to look at the impact of this feedback. How, how impactful do these people feel about it? So it's a feel thing. It's not just a number. And you would then prioritize it based on that. So you want to implement changes based on this. You want to turn your feedback into actionable insights. This often requires collaboration between departments. You know, your product development has to listen to marketing. It's crucial. Marketing needs to connect with product development. So I, I worked for a company that had, they, they, they developed hundreds, thousands of new products every single year. They had a huge staff of product development people. Okay, they were constantly coming up with new products, just constantly. And then they had an enormous uh, customer database where they would collect and analyze information coming up from customers. One of the strange things about this company was that there was no feedback of customer feedback to the product development people. I know that sounds very strange. Why would you collect all this data and, and not feed it into the product development people? Well, there, there was a view by the owners of the company that if you had good product development people, they would naturally develop good products. Personally, I think that was a giant risk, <laughs> okay? Uh, you, you, there, there should have been a way to translate the data, because of course the customer feedback was all about data people, and translate it into the creative types that were doing the product development. Obviously, creative types don't do data, and data people generally don't do creative speak, but there should have been a way to bridge that gap, and there was not. So again, this is a key point. You want to bring it inside, close the feedback loop and, and build these customer relationships. To foster trust and loyalty, you need to use active listening skills. Now, these are things like, what, do you know what to watch for in nonverbal communication cues? Um, I've, I've been doing some other webinars for different sections around here talking about generations, different generations. And one of the things, nonverbal communication cues can be difficult for our Generation Z people to see. They're, they're just not as attuned to nonverbal communication skills. They're very, very much attuned to, te to text, but nonverbal, they don't always see that. Uh, having empathy and understanding, you know, listening and really understanding what these people are saying and feeling. You need to ask open-ended questions. Don't ask questions that are leading, where you know the answer. Ask a question, well, was there anything else? Uh, what did you notice? Th these are open-ended questions to kind of gather, and, and you never know where an open-ended question is gonna go. It might take you into an entirely new direction. You also need to respect people's privacy and need to, they need to consent to answer your questions, okay? Uh, by respecting their privacy, they're more likely to consent to give you this information. And, and uh, that goes without saying, data security and protection is really important to not, not break that privacy 
uh, thing. You want to be transparent about data collection. We're going to take this data and do this with it. Tell them what you're going to do with the data. That's important for trust. So by personalizing and customizing your questions for your different customer segments, this will help you build on your customer retention. So how do we deal with negative feedback? Huh? What do you do here? Well, what's the value of complaints? Sometimes we don't want to hear the complaints because the complaints, oh, it's negative. I don't want to hear that. I want to know positive things. The thing is, the complaints can give you way more information. It's kind of like any of us involved in quality. We know that when something breaks, that's where we learn. And a negative complaint is where we learn. A positive, a positive statement about our product is kind of like, meh, <laughs> not helpful. You want to know how to deal with difficult or irate customers because those are going to be the complaints that are going to be the most emotional, heavy emotional content, and they're going to give you the biggest value, I think, in understanding what they feel. Now, here I am, a data guy, and I'm talking about feelings. Does this seem strange? <laughs> Okay, again, feelings are really important. If you can take a negative and turn it into a positive, this is gonna benefit a lot. One of the ways to do that is quick responses. If somebody complains and it takes months, that's not gonna be a good deal for you, okay? But if you can respond quickly and, and with empathy, your customers, even the most negative ones, they might become your most positive supporters. To do all of this, employees must be trained. You can't just stick someone in here dealing with irate customers. It is so unbelievably stressful to face irate customers day in and day out. Your employees need training. In some cases, they might need psychological counseling, okay, because of the stress of dealing with people who are negative all the time. Uh, an example of that, I was talking to a friend of mine who used to work as an airline ticket agent. You know, those people in the airport that sit behind the counter where all the com people come up to complaining about, oh, my flight was canceled, you gotta do something. And there's always some idiot who comes up and says, do you know who I am? <laughs> Nonsense. So I was talking to her and she said, the people behind the counter at airline, you know, accepting those complaints, they have been given authority to place the customer at the top of the next list or at the bottom of the list, depending on how the customer is behaving in front of them. Most people don't know this. If they did, they would be polite to the ticket people, okay? Because that's how you get in. That's how you get where you're going is by not stressing out the, the, the people behind the counter. So what are some of the common mistakes? Okay, failing to define clear objectives. Without clear goals and objectives for collecting feedback, you're, you're gonna gather data that doesn't line up with your strategic priorities. This can lead to a waste of resources. Not using multiple data sources. Relying solely on one data source, like surveys, can lead to a biased or incomplete picture. Combining multiple data sources, surveys, interviews, social media, customer reviews, it gives you a comprehensive view. Using leading questions. I don't think I have to say anything more about this, but it's going to get a preferred answer, and those won't really give you honest or unbiased feedback. If you ignore people who don't respond, the silent majority, okay? Uh, that could be a large portion of your customer base. And this gives you a biased sample, which doesn't represent all your customers. If your dissatisfied customers aren't saying anything, you know, you could have a lot of churn, lost customers. Sampling bias, you need to make sure that you're randomly selecting your customers. Now you could target a specific demographic group, or geographic region, or product users. But if you do that, make sure you are random within that selection 
if that's what you're after. Short surveys are better. A survey of two questions will get double the responses of a survey of five questions. And just 60 questions? No, that's not going to work. Sandy's point about the, the Kano analysis, where you have to ask a lot of questions to really understand what's going on, what you need to do there is don't ask everybody every question, right, Sandy? I mean, you, you could do that. And, and that way you assemble, I mean, if, you're, if your sampling is not biased, you can then assemble that, those multiple survey data, data points and come up with a full answer. Uh, you need to segment your data. Not all customers have the same needs, okay? So if you don't segment your data out, you're, you're gonna mask differences from one group to another. Not following up? Well, if you collect the data and you don't follow up and tell them what you're doing with it, that's gonna erode trust. Uh, unstructured data. Well, what is unstructured data? Social media posts customer reviews. Um, if you don't look at that text, you miss out on why. Why are people ranking you high or low? Not validating your feedback. Some customers may provide feedback that's emotionally charged, but it's not representative of the general sentiment. So, so you need to validate their feedback through other data sources. And, and you need to keep collecting it, okay, uh, so that you can keep your understanding of your customers up to date. Uh, all of these are common mistakes. And I, I think you can, you can look through them and identify what's going on. And again, if, if you wanna know more about this, Sandy and I have, you know, we, we've got bags of information on this, so you can let us ask us your question. So here's our question, here's our references. These are some of the things we used for this. There, of course, is the uh, CMQOE handbook that Sandy and I co-edited, Chapter 16. Uh, Sandy's uh, Process Analyst Handbook, of which the series is focusing on, uh, actually has information. Incidentally, it's also Chapter 16. I saw that. That's kind of curious. Uh, Sandy's uh, Certified Improvement Associate Handbook that she edited, Chapter 16 there again is voice of the customer. Isn't that odd, Sandy? It's always chapter 16. And I'm referencing Nancy Teague's quality toolbox here because there's lots of tools in there for that. So uh, this series represents nine segments that we've been through. Uh, if, you, if you want to see the book, the, the series was actually pulled from a handbook that Sandy, uh, process analyst that Sandy edited. The link is at the bottom. It is ASQ book H. 1579 and is available for sale by ASQ. Here's our contact information. So you can get a hold of us uh, if you want slides. And this will also be in the outgoing email that you'll receive after the talk. So, uh, Choba, you want to talk about this? So, um, I want to thank you both and then stop the recording and then we can go through this and also take the questions and answers. Will that be all right, Doug? Oh, that's that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, these are just okay. upcoming events. Yes. Okay.